She transported troops to the battlefields of World War II, took refugees to distant shores, and later helped win the Cold War. Left abandoned for years as part of the Ghost Fleet, the USNS General Hoyt S. Vandenberg has at last found her final resting place in the bright blue waters of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. The Vandenberg is just about two football fields long and 10 stories tall. And that makes Vandenberg the largest ship deployed in any marine sanctuary anywhere in the world. The first time I dove it, I hit the deck, and it was like, which way do I go? It was overwhelming, the amount of things to look at on that wreck. In her last mission as an artificial reef, the Vandenberg is attracting marine life, as well as scuba divers and fishermen. I've noticed huge amounts of uh, what they call fish balls. You swim through these, and they, and they scatter, and then they form around you again. It's an ever-changing canvas of marine life. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. South Florida is home to the world's third largest barrier reef, and many shipwrecks lie buried in her clear, warm waters. We do have uh, the, the three largest artificial reefs in the, in the world. The Oriskany being the largest, which is an aircraft carrier off of Pensacola, about 900 feet long. And then the Vandenberg comes in a distant second at 520 feet, but it's still a very excellent reef for diving. And then, of course, the Spiegel Grove down in Key Largo, which is a little bit shorter, about 512 feet. In the turquoise blue waters of the Florida Keys, a new attraction is drawing scuba divers from around the world. The USNS General Hoyt S. Vandenberg sunk seven miles off Key West in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. It is the newest addition to the Florida Keys wreck trek. There's no wreck that I've ever been on that can compare to the Vandenberg in words, and I've dove on many wrecks. I can say that it's one of the most unique dives I've ever had and I look forward to it each time I want to go down one more time. Built in the 1940s at the Kaiser Shipyard in California, she began her life as the General Harry Taylor. Its first mission in World War II was as a troop transport. It was at that time a USS, a US naval vessel, and it carried troops mostly to the European and the Pacific theaters. The war had ended in Europe and we were getting ready for the invasion of Japan. And uh, we, were, we were on our way and we decided, the captain decided to come across the Atlantic and go through Panama to go to Manila. The second day after the bombing in Nagasaki, the captain got on and made the announcement. He said, uh, men watch the bow of the ship as we turn and head for her. And we all, you know, you could hear a pin drop in the Atlantic because he could have said Calcutta, Canada, whatever. He said, New York, and here we have all these men, 3,500 men on board ship, and you could almost feel the ship coming out of the water for joy <laughs> that we were definitely going to go home. After the war, the ship was briefly decommissioned and then recommissioned as the U.S. N.S. Taylor. Its mission during those years was as a transport mostly for people who were displaced from Iron Curtain countries, concentration camp survivors, other prisoners of war. They came to the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. In 1958, the Taylor was decommissioned again and sent to the Mothball Fleet in Beaumont, Texas. 
But before long, this World War II ship was acquired by the Air Force and refitted for duty in the space age. Just eight working days after June 24, 1961, when the United States Air Force selected Sperry Rand Corporation as systems manager, a World War II C-4 troop ship was removed from the Hudson River Reserve Fleet and started on its way to becoming, in an extremely short time, the most instrumented tracking ship ever conceived. This first ship, the General R. E. Callan, and a sister ship, the General Taylor, from the Beaumont, Texas Reserve Fleet, were destined to become Aris I and II, the first two advanced range instrumentation ships, extending instrumentation coverage of the Atlantic Missile Range to over 9,000 miles. It took thousands of man-hours to convert the vintage transport vessel into a mobile missile tracking station. Outfitted with the latest technology of the time, her mission would be to provide exact data on all phases of a missile's performance from launch through termination of flight. It was during this time that she was renamed the U.S. AFS General Hoyt S. Vandenberg after one of the founding fathers of the United States Air Force. After two years of intense work, she was ready to assume her new duties. Bearing the proud name of General Hoyt S. Vandenberg, the second advanced range instrumentation ship was officially inducted into service at a dedication ceremony in Baltimore, Maryland. It was originally the U.S. AFS, one of the few ships to carry the designation U.S. Air Force ship. She tracked ICBM launches, ours, and the Russian launches. A lot of the operations were covert, very secret. She tracked the early Apollo and Gemini missions. It had some very sophisticated technology for the time on board. Those two big univacs, each one had a, about a meg of memory. Your watch has more today, but it was state of the art at the time and it was used to process all of the positioning data. Within a year, the ship was again acquired by the Navy and recommissioned as USNS General Hoyt S. Vandenberg. The Navy took the ship back and hired civilian crew from Pan Am and RCA that actually manned the technology. The RCA guys that served on Vandenberg during the Cold War eras say it with confidence that they feel that she contributed substantially to the ultimate fall of the Berlin Wall. Her Florida connection is that she was based at Canaveral. In 1983, after 20 years of service, the ship was transferred to the Maritime Administration, or MARID Reserve Fleet, on the James River in Virginia. It's where old U.S. ships go to die. Because of various regulations, they can't just be sent off to India to be busted up with sledgehammers. And the economics of salvaging them, it was such that for a good deal of that time, it cost more to cut them up than you would have gained from it. Except for a short stint as the movie set for the film Virus, during which time Cyrillic lettering was added to her hull, the Vandenberg sat abandoned as part of the ghost fleet in Virginia. Eventually, she was struck from the Naval Register until, in 1999, some dedicated people from Key West decided she would make an ideal artificial reef. Having the Vandenberg here for the city of Key West is good for two reasons, the environment and the economy. The Keys being a worldwide dive destination and the numbers in divers was declining and the businesses could feel that, so this would be a boost to that side of the economy. And the other side was the ecological side, the artificial reefs being a point for divers to go to and stay off of the reefs, which are under tremendous stress right now. There were a lot of things that made the Vandenberg a, a, a really primo selection. The Vandenberg had a really cool history that nobody knew about. The Vandenberg had the iconic radar dishes on the top and a really cool profile. We didn't want some old tanker we wanted something that was unique. Further, we looked at how people used artificial reefs for recreation, for fishing and diving, snorkeling, and glass bottom boats. And we got all of those things into Vandenberg. A lot of time and effort went into selecting the ideal site where the ship would eventually be sunk. 
we actually help valet park the ships. And in fact, we go out and select the bottom. We work with the contractors that are representing the interest group that are putting the ships out. And I send out um, some of our specialists that know the, the habitats, and we make sure we get it just far enough off the natural reef to, to not be a threat to the natural reef. The requirements that were necessary for the site was that it was on barren bottom and we made hundreds of dives out there to assure that there was no live rock or fish habitat. Some other things that went into consideration were can a submarine hide on the other side of the wreck, a draft clearance for cruise ships and how far away from the ship channel, and we did a lot of dives with handheld magnetometers to make sure there were no Spanish galleons buried in the sand underneath where the ship went. So it was quite an involved process. Some people question whether or not shipwrecks should be sunk as artificial reefs inside a national marine sanctuary. When the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary was designated by an act of Congress in 1990, there were three projects underway by the Keys dive community to sink artificial reefs in the Florida Keys. We agreed that we would allow the three projects that were underway to continue and that we would really focus on trying to gather the science that we needed to see if these were disrupting the natural habitat and what they were doing socioeconomically to the areas where they were being placed. In fact, of our 14 sites, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is the only one to allow ships to be sunk intentionally as artificial reefs. Now, clearly, we are the largest site for diving activity. That's very important for the economy, for the Florida Keys. I'm not saying that it fits all sanctuaries. In fact, it may not fit any of our other National Marine sanctuaries. Once the ship was selected, the long, hard process of planning and fundraising began to bring the ship to Key West. We dealt with you know, 18 different government agencies and we had to make them all happy. Boy, I'll tell you, in the old days, you used to just knock a hole in the bottom and let them go, and it's, that, that game has changed. It's breathtaking, the amount of paperwork and, and work that have gone into this. We've had to jump through ever smaller and ever much more flaming hoops all the way to do this. Everything from money to legal to accounting to the physical work of it, the insurance, tugboats. You know, they told you the Titanic was unsinkable. Geez, this one here, holy guacamole, it only took three years to build it, and it's taken 13 to sink. A lot of cleanup work went into readying the Vandenberg for her final mission. After being towed from the ghost fleet, she spent two years at a shipyard in Norfolk, Virginia. It became very difficult to clean it up to the levels that uh, we needed to, to clean it up. During the process of cleanup, the, the EPA and MARAD came out with a joint document for best management practices for cleaning a ship like this. So prior to that, we didn't really have a set methodology and protocols for cleaning a ship. We took over 100 miles of possibly PCB containing wire out of the ship. We took over 70 watertight doors. The ship had half a million gallons of fuel on it, lots of machinery, duct work, insulation. We even had guys climbing in some of the big pieces of machinery, cleaning with Q-tips to clean this thing out. So it was a very meticulous, long process. It involved something over 80,000 man hours. <laughs> 